Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest is Aaron Baker. But for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Sure, Andrew. Uh, as you said, I'm Aaron Baker. I'm a, the founding director of Caleb's Commission, which is a pro-Israel non-profit uh, charity. We uh, do public speaking, teaching on the importance of Israel, foundations of the Christian faith, and uh, give people on ramps to travel to and, and bless Israel. And we are uh, based out of Arkansas in the United States, and we travel uh, back and forth to Israel and the area as often as possible. Hmm. Um, and do you have a website that people could go and check out? We currently don't have a website. We're using okay. just social media at this time. Okay. Caleb's Commission can be easily found on Facebook um, just by searching Caleb's Commission. Okay, perfect. So you also do something on survival and such like? Yeah. Could you tell us so what I, you do in that area? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my background's in emergency management. I'm actually working towards my master's degree uh, on that subject right now. And uh, I have a background in uh, disaster relief. Uh, I've uh, traveled the world uh, teaching on disaster preparedness, how to uh, prepare not only for your own self and your family, but to be in a place where you can help others. Um, so the, uh, uh, the principle is not to necessarily hunker in the bunker, but prepare to share. To, to be a, a true responder, someone who is um, uh, has taken care of themselves so they can take help others, you know, um, be taken care of as well. Look, mm. I like that. Hunker in the bunker or prepare to share. I'm going to take that as my motto. I'm going to start asking people, do you hunker in the bunker or are you prepared to share? <laughs> I like that. It's really good. So, so a minute, let's unpack that statement for a minute. Yeah. What, explain what hunker in the bunker means and what prepared to share is just so that we, yeah, we know what we're actually looking at. Absolutely. I, I bring that up because very quickly uh, this subject can lead to a number of rabbit trails that are not um, productive or not um, very helpful. And so uh, there's plenty of materials for folks out there that uh, do want to only prepare uh, for their own sake and their own good. Uh, so uh, we, we don't really uh, spend a lot of time on that. Our heart is to uh, minister to people with the heart of Jesus and uh, with uh, courage and faith. And so we would see that people would make preparations for their, for their own self, but do it in a way that is equipping and preparing them to minister to others in times of crisis. Um, so so if we're talking about this, about being prepared, just pick up those two words. I think everybody at the minute is wishing they had been more prepared. Yeah. I think most people, when a disaster hits, realise they weren't prepared. It's always something that, well, unless you live in a real disaster zone, it's always something that's going to happen to somebody else. Oh, it's going sure. to happen somewhere else. I mean, we live in a sleepy little place in the UK. Um, I shouldn't think the fact that we would be in a position where there were food shortages and stuff like that ever crossed people's minds. Mm. So can you, can you start to talk to the average person who is sitting in their homes and who is now beginning to wake up to the fact that maybe some preparedness would be a good thing? Where do we start? How do we start thinking about it? Yeah, what you're talking about is uh, is a challenge. It's it's foresight, really, is what you're talking about, and it's nearly impossible to uh, preconceive every different contingency, every different uh, scenario and possibility. So, emergency managers um, endorse a concept called um, all hazard preparedness. And I'm going to start off by answering your question by explaining this. And what that basically means is um, instead of zeroing in, zeroing in on any particular type of scenario and trying to uh, prepare specifically for each and every different scenario, which would be uh, very difficult to do, 
you look at some of the common denominators that most uh, regional or large scale disasters share. And um, one of the ways you, you can do that is to consider what's called the, uh, the hierarchy of needs. And the first thing a lot of people think of is food. And that's because we as humans, we often think with our gut before we think with our mind. I know and I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you might uh, think about stocking up on coffee and tea and, and sugar and biscuits, but that may not necessarily be the, the thing that you need the most um, unexpectedly. And so the, the hierarchy of needs uh, states that one of the, the primary things that we need as humans to maintain at any given time is shelter. And uh, uh, gratefully, we're, we're blessed with, you know, brick and mortar shelter today. Uh, but there are aspects of shelter, um, whether sheltering in place or being, you know, out on the road that uh, can be compromised uh, quickly. Um, so, for example, in uh, FEMA's, uh, you know, uh, readiness uh, list, uh, they suggest things such as, uh, you know, plastic sheeting and duct tape or other uh, sealing or filtering type materials that can be stored in small quantities to, um, uh, to repair or effectively improve one's ability to shelter in place, uh, whether in your home or you know, outside of your home. Uh, uh -huh. So that, that's one thing. Um, and then food is, is further on down the list. You, know, you, need, you, you have to be able to breathe air, you need to be able to protect yourself from the elements, um, you can go for about three days without water. So water becomes an essential element rather quickly. And food is really like number four and number five on that list. So that's the first thing I, I remind people is uh, to kind of flip their normal paradigm kind of on its head and consider the things that are most uh, life preserving and life sustaining and work in that order. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, again, some of those um scenarios have common denominators and um, focus on those common denominators of, you know, how could you continue to stay in your home if, uh, you know, infrastructure is compromised, you, you know, the utilities that today we take, you know, for granted. So staying warm, staying dry, staying, you know, protected otherwise from the elements um, is, has to remain one of the highest um, priorities as you consider the different things that you can practically do to, to be prepared for an all hazards uh, type uh, response. Now, people may be a little confused given the times that we've just gone through as to what's really important for survival. And maybe you can help clear this up because as soon as everyone <laughs> thought they were gonna struggle for survival during COVID, all the toilet roll vanished <laughs> off the shelves. So can you just, just clarify, is toilet roll an essential for survival? <laughs> It is not essential. It's not. It's, it's, it's not. Huh. Not when we really think about it and drill it down. But it's a, it's a perfect example of humans or human nature thinking with their gut or uh, other uh, aspects related to it. <laughs> um, it's really, that's what it points out. You know, it, and it was that gut, quote, quote, unquote, gut reaction and um, I'm still not sure that people understand exactly what it was other than what, what you saw was a, 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 an expression or a manifestation of a fear-based gut reaction. And uh, that's one of the things I teach about is the difference between response and react. And so the, that dilemma um, can make a, make a big difference. Understanding the difference between those two things and being able to exercise a, 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 whiz, a wise response versus a, a knee-jerk reaction can make uh, life or death differences in your, um, you know, your your behavior towards disaster and other emergencies. Mm. But uh, yeah. I, you know, I agree that toilet paper is uh, a lovely thing, and it's uh, it is some some important. You know, it does have some importance, uh, but it was severely overemphasized. Yeah. in that particular case. And yeah. so was food, other food shortages at the same time, you know, you go to the supermarket and you'd see toilet paper was missing and then like meat, you know, and, um, and then some other shortages. And you can really almost uh, look at those shortages and work backwards through them to really understand the psyche of, you know, uh, the, the, the crowd, if you will. Yeah. And, um, and really look at how uh, illegitimate 
those concerns were. Um, you know, so it, it's really interesting to use that as a as a case study and dissect it. Yeah, I guess the toilet roll takes on some sort of form of comfort blanket, if you like. <laughs> I think I think that's a really good way to put it. I, think I, I had the theory felt better having toilet paper, yeah. like emotionally. So I, I had two theories about it. One was it's if everybody else thinks it's necessary, it must be necessary. So I better go and get it and I'll find out why it's necessary <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. That, that sort of elicits a panic response because yeah. you see the shelves empty. So you think you, you weren't panicking about toilet paper. No. Then everyone else started panicking about it. So then you decide maybe I should panic about toilet paper. <laughs> so that was one of my theories. And, and recognizing that we are reacting to that versus responding is, is vitally important because it would be very easy to put all of your attention and all your resources on something like that and overlook the things that are more essential and more core to making it successfully to the next day. So on a more serious note on that, would it be the difference between if you were in a burning building and you saw everybody running in one direction and you just run in that direction because everybody else is, but one person's following another, another, and actually the emergency exits behind you, but you never stop to actually Assess think it about it. And that would be the similar but more serious res response. Yeah, absolutely. And we can, you know, uh, think of several examples in recent history where there was significant loss of life because uh, people uh, were reacting in the wrong direction and taking other people with them. And so it's very important for us to, you know, you can't help but notice when the crowd is moving in a certain direction, but you've got to, in the moment, take the, the time and the, the, the mental wherewithal to understand, is, is this really what I should be doing? And taking, you know, um, in the moment, personal responsibility for yourself and, and making the best decisions, you know, on the fly. And, that, and that's sometimes easier said than done. The, mm. the, the perspective that I come from is a spiritual perspective. It reminds me of when Peter was on the water with uh, Messiah. And uh, when Peter started to look at the waves, he began to sink. But as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, he, he stayed, you know, above the waters. And that's the attitude that I try to take in my own life, too, is, is to keep my eyes on the Lord. You know, when he uh, ascended into heaven, he promised us his Holy Spirit who would help us. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's how I rely on God, uh, you know, to understand what to do, when to do it, and, and how to do it properly, uh, you know, to, to uh, wake up another day. So, so really, and this links in with what you've just shared as well. Another theory I had about the whole toilet roll scenario, which is a good, it is a good example, isn't it? Um, is that you lose control in in these situations? Everything's outside your control. You have no control. And I thought maybe you know another response is if I can go and get some toilet rolls, I have maintained some control because it's something I can go out, I can do, I can feel a sense of achievement. Yeah. Because I come back with a pack of toilet oh, rolls. If you managed to get toilet roll, it was an achievement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got, you found the golden egg if you managed to get toilet roll. So, yeah. so again, yeah, people, you, you something felt like you won, won the the disaster. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that's a really great point, Daphne. Um, I, I think it also points to um, sometimes just action feels better than inaction, even yeah. if it's not the right action. There's a, a funny saying, you know. Uh, don't just do something, stand there, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and that's, I think what we uh, sometimes do, we think that um, some kind of goal oriented action is better than inaction, when many times it's not, it's not the right, it's not the right thing to do it at that time. And, uh, but yes, I, I think too, it was also something tangible. It was, um, it was a pursuit that occupied the mind and the body. And, and got almost just got people's attention off the real the real issue, um, because while we were and I say we because I I felt the the gravity and the pull of that that fear you know based uh, that fear driven uh, activity um, you know I, I think back and I think what was I not thinking about what was I not focusing on how was I not preparing the day or two that I spent trying to track down enough toilet paper for myself my family and any visitors that we might have. Mm. Uh, we're still working on that box, by the way. Uh, 
uh, in case anybody is in the neighborhood and uh, needs a little extra, you're welcome to come by and I'll, I'll give you a roll. So earlier on, you alluded to um, this prepare for a wide range of things uh, that you can't prepare for everything, but you can prepare for common denominators. And right. you said that, uh, oh, well, I think you said, uh, Daphne, that um, people might think, well, it's never going to happen to me. They live in a region where it doesn't happen. Disasters don't happen very often. Uh, and even using us in, as an example, we live in an area of England where we're actually, we don't get extremes of anything. So we don't get any crazy snow. We don't get any flooding. We don't get earthquake. You know, all, we don't get extremes. We kind of live in a nice little pocket. But because of our lifestyle, we travel, we have ended up in um, typhoons, uh, we've been in uh, around disaster, um, tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, um, terrorist targets. They can. You can't. Let's leave. <laughs> let's leave terrorism <laughs> out for now. Okay. We can do this on another day. But but we live in a safe area. But in the course of our lives, we've been in a number of disaster situations, and so even sleeping in a in a hotel um, at night, wow. the alarm's gone off. Uh, my family, my, my co-host, my mum, my sister, they've left and left me lying in bed in a hotel room thinking that I would have woken up. They left me to burn while they just let, walk, waltzed on out of the room to leave the hotel. Anyway, there are th certain things in our lives which have taught us that we should prepare a little better. We <laughs> should, um, so for example, if we go to a hotel now, we are very aware of our surroundings. We look, where's the exit? So we know, okay, if an alarm goes off this time, the direction we're heading in, we're not flying all over the place. And we put our suitcases out of the way yeah. of the door because we were falling, falling over Falling over the suitcases. Mm -hmm. So now we've been in enough situations where we realise we need to take certain steps to prepare ourselves in case something happens. So what are some basic things that people can do to prepare themselves for for general emergencies if something comes up when they're... When they're out so a couple of, uh to uh piggyback off of what you were saying you're talking about a couple of things one you're talking about situational awareness which i think is key understanding what situation situational awareness is and uh practicing and exercising that that's something that um that um your your best tool is your mind your best kit your best equipment is your your own mind and so um training your mind uh, towards uh, situational awareness is something that um, even if you jumped out of bed and had to run out of the room, you'd still have it with you. Um, the other thing that you talked about is uh, recognizing the need for a plan and having some even basic plan. Um, and obviously, as you pointed out, it, it includes um, having a, a plan for communication too. Uh, if we needed to leave this building in a hurry, uh, where are we going to meet up? and who's gonna tell who where we're going, basically. It can be really simple. So, um, and then that brings up another point too, keeping it, I think the thing that makes it difficult for people to feel like they can get started is that they get overwhelmed with the complexity, the, the potential complexities of the various mm -hmm. disasters. And so keeping it simple uh, and uh, a simple plan, um, developing situational awareness, and then also, um, some tangible, practical um, items uh, that you might consider a kit. Uh, ladies have a little bit of an advantage over the men because uh, they have a purse and they have, uh, they actually practice emergency management all the time with a purse. Um, <laughs> and uh, I knew when I was a child, if I needed something, I needed a breath mint or a toothpick or a comb, I could always go to my mom and she'd would have the, those essential items in the purse. So it's really, um, if you will, an extension of that. Uh, guys, you know, nowadays uh, it's not uncommon for us to have a backpack slung over our shoulder or some kind of a, a briefcase or something, you know, like that. And so think about the things that um, there's two, two types of items. There's comfort items that just make you kind of feel better and help you get through your day. But then there's more uh, practical, essential items that you could have, you know, with you or near you, uh, gathered together as a kit. And um, Daphne, something you were saying earlier uh, helped me remember 
that one of the things we teach are the 10 essentials. And whether it's 10 essentials or nine essentials or eight essentials, we can all mm -hmm. think of a handful of things, half a dozen things that we find that we rely on, on a regular basis. One of those I'm sure uh, each of you have uh, near you right now, and I do too, is a cell phone, a smartphone. Um, and uh, while the network that it's on isn't always going to be reliable, there's uh, so many uh, things that you can do with the smartphone these days, uh, whether it's, um, you know, um, connected to a uh, internet or not. So having um, some form of way to communicate, you know, to your friends and family members uh, is, is really essential as far as coordinating efforts and, um, and finding people. But um, uh, one of the things I carry around uh, regularly in a backpack is uh, the ability to, uh, you know, a water container something I can uh, refill, um, you know, easily and stay hydrated. Um, maybe uh, medications that, that you uh, need on a regular basis, having those handy to you. Um, and some of the other basics are some, you know, when the phones fail, you may need to leave a note for somebody, having a little pad of paper and a pen, a little sewing kit, you know, uh, to make repairs on the fly, things like that. Um, but some of them, like I said, can be more comfort items. Um, and, and having a little, uh, some hard candy or some breath mints or something like that, you know, uh, can really help you with the positive, positive mental attitude. Uh, going back to that, um, your greatest asset is being, you know, uh, you know in, your, in your mind. And so um, all those other little trinkets, if you will, or, or kit, really just uh, go to support, maintain that positive mental attitude uh, that would, that's actually going to get you, uh, through these variety of disasters, probably more than any, uh, little, uh, trinket or gadget that, you know, you could purchase or slip in your pocket. But, um, uh, so just thinking about what those essentials are for e each of us, that's going to be a little different, but thinking about what those eight, nine, 10 things are on a daily basis that, you know, if we lost or misplaced, we would feel like, you know, it was, you know, it was a, it was a terrible, um, situation car keys, things like that, keeping those kinds of things handy so that you have options, uh, you know, at the last minute. And of course, if you've got small children, you're thinking about another nine or 10 essentials. Yeah, that is true. And, um, and it's a little counterintuitive, but just like when we're on the airplane, they say, put the, the, you know, the mask on yourself first and then your child. And that, that doesn't seem, you know, any father or mother is not going to want to do that but you have to be able to take care of yourself so that you can take care of the little ones too. So there is, there is some self-sacrifice involved, but if you completely sacrifice yourself, then you're also potentially sacrificing the welfare um, or the lives of those that are also depending on you. So there's a little bit of a rewiring and retraining that goes along uh, with that as well. I should think, uh, uh, I'm listening to you and thinking how important it is to think this through ahead of time. Because you're saying it's not even that you, you're saying things that we think, oh, yeah, that's revolutionary or that's good. But it's having a moment in time where you pause and you stop and you think and you focus rather like in the hotel now where we actually, when we go to a hotel, when we can leave the country to go, um, that you actually are very deliberate in looking where the emergency exit it only takes a moment but we've focused yeah. for a moment and what you're saying really is take some time to focus on these things doesn't cost a lot to do so but it could be life-changing and learning as well from from what's happened before and what other people have gone through i know in new orleans after katrina or during katrina and there were people that were having to go up into their attic yes. or their loft to to get away from the rising waters but some of them got trapped and ended up dying in their lofts and their attics because there was no escape right. and um so after that a number of people started to get axes um uh, hatchets and they would put those in their attics and their lofts so that they could use them to try and get through the the right. roof um which again is that you know really thinking these things through um to prepare for things that might may happen yeah. And one of the things you're talking about, Andrew, is egress. Basically, no matter where you're at, if you're in your home or out on the road, hotel, egress is the, 
the avenue and the method by which you can get out of a situation and not put yourself in a, in a worse situation. So they were wise to rise above the waters to get up in the attic, but unfortunately they created a dead end situation for them. They were trying to avoid the water outside the house, but in this case, it would have made more sense for them to actually exit the house and then, you know, find a way to get up on the roof rather than to, um, you know, choose that, that dead end. And that's a very unfortunate thing that happened, you know, with a lot of individuals, but that, that's an example of, um, uh, that can be applied across a number of scenarios. And, uh, and like you said too, you know, and, and uh, my wife and I, you know, anytime we travel, if we take the elevator up, you know, to a, a, a upper level of a hotel, we're always looking for where that staircase is. You don't want to be looking for the staircase at three o'clock in the morning when the sirens are going off and maybe you can't see down the hall because of smoke or because of the number of people that are converging in the hallways. So just have, um, and like you said too, it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to order it online. You don't have to have it in your back pocket. You just have to um, be aware that that potentially can save your life and the life of the lives of those that you love and, and begin to practice it. And it's like a, any other kind of muscle. The more you practice it, like we do it now, but I, I hardly even realize that we do it. And I hope we never need it, but we do it on a, a pretty consistent basis now. And sometimes and we'll have a little dialogue about it. We'll be up, going up on the elevator and say, hey, did you see that that stairwell was blocked, you know, by a cart or something like that? Mm -hmm. And then that's it. We don't dwell on it. It's not, we're not, you know, uh, doing it out of fear, but just um, uh, doing it in wisdom. And, um, and like I said, hoping that it's something we notice, you know, we, we put it on a shelf and hope that we don't need it. But if we do need it, it's right there. It's ready to go uh, in a moment's notice. Yeah, we're, we're very similar. We've, um, we've been doing that ourselves as well, more so in the last few years. But for us, um, in, in a similar kind of way, we've been in a lot of dangerous situations, not from natural disasters, but from uh, potential terrorist situations. <laughs> um people tried to kill us uh, a couple of years ago in a country and so when when we travel we're now it's sort of second nature to be constantly surveying where you are who's around what's going on you know if something happens where do we go and so i know for me um that like you said once you get used to doing it it just becomes what you do you don't even <coughs> like have to think about it but using us as a bad example too just because of our, we've got a mixture of both. Um, I thought this is a good example of what not to do, but typifies, I think, an emergency situation. We were in Hong Kong and there was a hurricane. No, um, I think it was a typhoon or something. A typhoon. And we had just been left in wherever we were staying and we didn't have any food and anything. So there's this typhoon going on. We look out the window and we see a, a garage and we thought, oh, good. We can go and um, get something to eat. And we, it looked windy and wet, but we're yeah. from England. I mean, it looks windy and wet a lot. So, <laughs> you know. So I pick up an umbrella. The first thing I pick up. Got to keep keep your hair dry. So, so we go out in, the, in this typhoon with an umbrella, which, of course, didn't last too long. Yeah, that was hassle. And, and we sort of get across the road to, to, to this garage to get something to eat. And the man there looks horrified. And, he's, and, of course, he's a local. And he said, you need to go back. So with our umbrella, we go back. And some bread, I think. Uh, and we did get some bread. <laughs> but I thought that is a good example because all these situations, we are almost like in a foreign place. You know, our normal... Um, you guide. get disorientated. Yeah. yeah. And, and our normal guidelines aren't there, our normal ways of responding, because I responded with an umbrella. It's a bit wet, umbrella. So we respond in the context of life as we know it, right. where actually it is like we were in, in Hong Kong, all foreign territory, all completely um, different, and, and we cannot respond in the way we would in everyday life. So I thought that was quite a good example of getting yeah, it wrong. Wonderful example. And some of the best lessons that, you know, we have learned and, and I can tell that you've learned have been from those, you know, uh, we laugh at them now. It wasn't probably, probably didn't feel funny then. Uh, but, you know, these near misses or these, um, you know, these mishaps, if you will, 
Mm. And um, it, it's a really uh, a valuable source or a resource of um, lessons, you know? And uh, so what would you do differently? Uh, that's, that's what I ask myself for forward thinking. What, in the, given the same circumstances now, knowing what you know, what would, would, what would you have done differently? What would we have done differently? That, I think I'd have probably In that tried, particular scenario. I think I'd have probably tried to find a local who was the same side of the road as us, poke my head out the door and say, is it okay for us to cross the road and go to that garage? But, but the thing is, at the time we didn't think, because it didn't look that bad. It yeah. didn't look that bad. And in reality, we probably could have just waited yeah. and eaten the next day. And just starved a little bit. It We would have been okay. But, like we were saying earlier, sometimes we think with our stomach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so um, our stomach ruled the day in that situation. I think with a lot of things we should have done differently. And, and like you're getting us to think back to what we would have done differently is probably a good exercise for many people if they're relating to our crazy stories when you get it wrong. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think we can all learn from each other's crazy stories. I think that's an incredible tool that we have um, as as humans is that the reflection and the, you know, reviewing the scenario of what, how could I have done that better? And then applying that going forward, not losing those lessons uh, that were <laughs> so uh, earnestly uh, uh, acquired, um, mm. but applying those things going forward. And everybody's going to bring, you know, unique um, experiences and perspectives. The other thing you ran into is you ran into somebody that was perceiving the situation differently than how you were perceiving it. And it's possible that the way you were perceiving the weather was actually more reasonable than the way they were perceiving it. Um, just because, you know, you don't have local experience with that weather, you have, um, you know, uh, other experience with weather. And you're, you know, able to, you know, reasonably discern um, if something's dangerous or not. But it almost sounded like you ran into somebody who was, had a lot more fear of what was going on than, than you did. Because, you know, I know you guys and you, you don't lack, you know, wisdom. And, and uh, so sometimes you, you run into that too. I, I'll share just a quick uh, story uh, of something that happened to me when I was uh, leading a disaster relief uh, response to a major hurricane that hit a U.S. city uh, several years ago, and um, it was uh, it was storm season. It was tornado season in in the uh, center of Tornado Alley, what we call Tornado Alley, and we had trained seasoned responders uh, there with me. Uh, there were ten or twelve people uh, that uh, that I was helping to lead, and one night the clouds started rolling back in, and the thunder kicked up, and the lightning was close by. And what a lot of the people didn't understand was the tornado sirens that were about to go off were being sounded across the entire county because they had one concern uh, in the other part of the county, which was quite a ways away. But myself and a meteorologist who was on scene with me, we were tracking the storms and we saw that we were way out of harm's way, even though we knew that the, sound, the sirens were about to sound. Well, about that time that the sirens started so sounding off, about half of the people that were with me came up to us quickly and said, what should we do? What should we do? And I said, you know, um, the, the sirens are a little disconcerting, but the, the severe weather is far enough away that we, we're fine. We can just continue to monitor it at this time. The other half of the responders were frantic and, and reacting and, and looking for a place to, to uh, hunker in the bunker, so to speak. They were literally looking at a crawl space under the building that had a dirt floor and we're trying to figure out how to cram half a dozen people into this hole. I kept telling them it's not necessary at this time. You know, I, I'm not going to stop you from doing that, but it's not necessary. By the time they almost figured out how to get everybody in the hole, the sirens were ending and basically the, uh, you know, the clouds were parting and, and the, the, the storm blew over. But the, the point that that illustrates is the difference between, you know, responding and reacting. And, um, you know, you guys went, you know, across the street to find some food. You didn't, you weren't really concerned. Uh, but the person that was, was there, even though they're local, doesn't mean that they have a better understanding of, you know, weather phenomena. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I heard from your story was someone that you encountered that was, was uh, full of fear 
and they're going to respond in a certain way. And just because we encounter people who are responding out of fear, like natural fear, doesn't mean that, you know, that that's what we, you know, should do. So mm -hmm. I want well, to. Well, that leads um, into the, sure the next question I was going to ask um, is how can we how can we guard ourselves against preparing with fear? Because I think everybody is on high alert at the minute across the world. I mean, COVID has just put people into a, um, the potential for a really high fear reaction on, on multiple levels. So how can we take a step back and how can we start preparing going forward, not driven by fear, which will encourage us to go out and buy a thousand toilet rolls? Right. Um, so um, I think that's a, a great uh, question. I, I'm going to answer it in a little bit of an unconventional way. I, I actually think um, two things. One, um, a certain amount of fear can be helpful, um, but only in small amounts. Um, if you get a little nervous near uh, the ledge of a high cliff, that can be helpful. That can keep you from uh, getting too close to the edge of the cliff. But that's not really the kind of fear that, you know, you and I are talking about right now. Um, the other thing, too, is um, as believers, uh, we are to operate in fear, but not in a natural sense. We're supposed to operate in the fear of the Lord. Yeah. And um, it sounds like a play on words a little bit, but I think it's an important distinction because when we have a, a truly developed sense of what it means to have a fear of the Lord, which, as the Bible points out, is the beginning of wisdom then we make less room for the other fear, the natural fear that drives many people to buy too much toilet paper or too many, uh, you know, this or that at the store. So I would say begin with um, pursuing a biblical uh, understanding and practice of uh, a holy fear of the Lord. And that will um, leave less room for all these other fears that drive all these other uh, behaviors and actions. Um, does that help to answer that a little bit? I may have gotten definitely. off on a little bit of a rabbit trail. No, definitely. And and I think probably it's a good place to begin to draw to a conclusion because I think you've given us a lot to think about. I think, um, thank you for really helping us to hone in on our own experience as well as um, just think about running forward. And probably if we at least just take the advice you give us about going back and what could I do differently is a huge one. And, and to remember that food is not the top priority, but there's so much in what you said, Aaron, that could, if we stop and think and make a list of all the things you sent would at least ground us into moving forward. And uh, maybe another time um, you can come back and we'll take all of this from an, another perspective too. Yeah. It's a good, a good, um, place to to stop here is that drawing the dif distinction between a fear which drives to panic and, and a fear which drives to respect and um i think that's a good a good place to pause for now um thank you so much for for taking the time to talk to us we really appreciate it it's been really fascinating hopefully people will hear this will sit down think about where they are think about places they're going to and just make plans preparation points just in case something was to happen that they would be able to respond and not react to those situations so thank you so much thank you Aaron. my pleasure thank you thank you for listening to this episode if it inspired you please rate us and subscribe on apple or google podcasts spotify or another podcast platform